Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome back to the Cyber Underground. I'm Dave Stevens, your host. I teach with the University of Hawaii, Kapiolani Community College. I teach network security and ethical hacking. And we handle security here on this show in all of its forms. And even ethical hacking includes physical security. And a piece of the physical security of the United States that we never think about is the United States Air Force Auxiliary, the Civil Air Patrol. And today with me, we have Lieutenant Colonel David Shoemaker, Ed D. It's like a PhD for education, am I right? Yes. All right, welcome. Thanks for being on the show. And people should know for, uh, for the sake of disclaimer, full disclosure, you're my father. And I'm real proud of you. And uh, you're a local boy. I want to hear uh, you tell us a little bit about your history. And the pride is mutual. <laughs> uh, I'm from Honolulu. I was born at the old Tripler. Uh, my father was in the service, married a local girl. And uh, Punahou grad. Yes, yeah. Punahou grad. Yeah. Uh, went there on a tennis scholarship. And uh, in 1943, they were evacuated back to the mainland. Because all the families had to go back home, quote unquote. Home. <laughs> but but my she mother was from here. <laughs> this is home. <laughs> right, right. Sorry, home is the mainland. And you know how the Army is. Off we went. So um, where did she end up? She was Ohio or someplace? Uh, Iowa. Iowa. Okay. Devon Midwest. Port, Iowa, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Uh, but it was an inter interesting place to stay. But we had to fight World War II, and uh, there's a large threat here to the islands at the time. Yes. Yeah. Right. And uh, I find it very interesting now that I have a, a Japanese-American daughter-in-law. Uh, yeah, Thank my you wife. for that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and she's wonderful. She's wonderful, yeah. She brings to our family a whole set of, of uh, cultural norms and, and ideals that uh, uh, the men in the family very badly need. <laughs> Wait, we're not pragmatic, logical people? Oh, well, <laughs> not to the degree that we don't. Is. We don't always follow the rules, but <laughs> us? <laughs> and I became aware of that culture when I, I did my master's in Asian studies uh -huh. at San Jose State University for the Army as a part of the foreign area program. Um, I grew up in the Army and uh, went to a military college served 21 years in the Army, worked for the Army as a civilian for five years, and then finally went into community college education. And now in there, in your service, uh, they sent you to Vietnam. Yes. And you actually had to serve in combat. Yes. And I'm a very grateful person that you made it out of combat alive, because you served during some of the hairiest times of Vietnam, and you're even a Silver Star awardee. And uh, thanks for for serving, first of all, and then thanks for surviving, uh, the most important part. Well, the Silver Star came from, from uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I hear that story a lot. Yes, <laughs> and not, probably not being grown up enough to realize uh, the situation. Maybe you should just leave. <laughs> Everybody else did. <laughs> so I spent the night alone uh, face to face with the force that we were against and uh, air support kept me alive. So I'm very grateful to pilots. And uh, I was, in fact, at that time, a pilot. So but you started flying when you were in the Army, and then you continued your private pilot uh, adventure all the way up until you joined the CAP? Yes, and um, I became a commercial instrument and uh, instructor rated. And then I quit flying for 36 years, and I came back to it when I joined the CAP. And don't let anybody kid you, it's not like riding a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, you do, you do a lot of work to keep It's a lot the, of work to... The new equipment, the new standards. Yes. Uh, you get checked out on a new plane every once in a while. Yes. It's, a, it's a lot of work and a lot of study time. And we have a lot of uh, new equipment all the time, so it's, um, we're being upgraded all the time. The Air Force takes good care of us. Now, this is amazing. You, you retire from, from teaching and you go into the CAP. At the same time, you're a city councilman, or until recently. Yes. You were a city councilman up in Washougal, Washington. Eight years. And I, unbelievable that you're still alive after doing the CAP <laughs> and that, and you're supposed to be quote unquote retired, uh, but now it's just the CAP, and you just, 
took a different position with the CAP. So let's let's talk about the CAP now. Now that we know about you and uh, and how we're related and and your local boy, the CAP now. Let's talk about the U.S. Air Force Auxiliary Civil Air Patrol. What are some of its roots? Why is it here? What does it do? What's its mission? A week before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the, the Civil Air Patrol was founded. A week before? Yes, and its job was coastal defense. Okay. And so they flew uh, patrols along the defense uh, on the coast, particularly on the east coast, uh, and looking for submarines. And a week later, the the war started in the Pacific. Um, and we had some presence out here, but for a long time our presence was mainly on the East Coast. And that was because it was formed by uh, Fiorella, Fiorella LaGuardia, who later became the mayor of New York. Oh, and we have LaGuardia Airport now. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he was head of civil defense, and we were part of civil defense. And then after the, after the war, uh, and we, we saw wartime service. Uh, we lost a couple of uh, planes and crews. Uh, were shot down uh, or went down in, in, in World War II. It, yes, in the wow. Atlantic. We also uh, took credit for at least one submarine. So you actually found a submarine? They, they took bombs and dropped them out the window. Really? And they got one? <laughs> <laughs> They're lucky, gonna take credit. Lucky hit. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a fascinating history and after the war uh, the, the Congress made us the official United States Air Force Auxiliary in 1948, and they assigned us three missions. Um, cadet programs, aerospace education, and the one that I'm very fond of, emergency services. So we should backtrack just a little bit. 1947 is when the Army Air Corps broke off and became the U.S. Air Force. It is. A year later, you, your CAP was the official U.S. Air Force Auxiliary. Yes. So a lot of changes happened in the Uniformed Armed Services in the late 40s, right after yes. the war, yeah. Um, and the CAP, uh, as the auxiliary, is an all-volunteer force, and we we get we don't get paid for anything. No salaries. No salaries. Keeps the budget low. Keep the budget low. No we, benefits. That's <laughs> actually, well. Actually, uh, when we fly Air Force missions, mm. we fly as airmen since 2015. U.S. Air Force airmen. I see. So you if, have that position in the Air Force while you're in the air as while crew. we're in the air, and uh, we're covered by their. Uh, accident insurance uh, during that time, but that's the only time. And uh, the Air Force will pay, will reimburse us for fuel and oil and things like that. Uh, if they send us to remote locations on an Air Force mission, uh, they'll bill at us and feed us. Uh, but that's, that's our pay. Most of our pay comes from the satisfaction that we derive from serving, and that's what most of the people in CAP came there for, to, con to continue to serve. And it makes a great outfit. Right, there's, there's a drive in, in many people to continue to serve. Uh, and I think when people get out to, of the military, especially retirees, they, they feel a little lost for a while. They that, do. Where's my service? What am I doing to better my nation, to, to serve my community? And, and they struggle to find that, that place in the universe, and you found two of them at the same time, the city council and the CAP, and I'm glad you've toned it down a bit, uh, but you're, you're going back to flying, and uh, that's one of the most important missions of the Civil Air Patrol is actually flying. So let's talk about some of the missions of the Civil Air Patrol now. Well, we, we do emergency services, and that consists of um, homeland defense uh, flights, and, and I'd like to talk a little bit about those in a second, as well as uh, disaster recovery. Uh, we do a lot of photographic missions for Department of Defense, for state governments, for the Homeland Security people, uh, Homeland Security Department, and various other government agencies. Uh, so that keeps us pretty busy. And the Air Force is, uh, has equipped us with fantastic photographic and infrared capabilities. You got neat toys. Say again? You got neat toys. Oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> if you're interested in toys, uh, we're the outfit for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the air crews are, um, many of them are prior service, and uh, not all of them are pilots. Uh, we have four positions in an aircraft. Uh, there's the pilot, there's the observer, who's the, the mission uh, director, and then there, in the back seat, we have the scanner and the photographer. 
And if we don't have, if it's not a photographic mission, if it's, search, if it's a search mission, we'll put two scanners in there because their function is primarily to search on both sides of the aircraft. Pilot doesn't search. Pilot flies. That's directed, a good thing. Directed by the observer. Observer also handles communications with our headquarters. Pilot handles the flying communications with uh, a local center, air traffic control center and things, towers and things like that. Um, and then the observer also uh, covers uh, the right side of the aircraft on, on the search. So the, and the scanners in the back uh, take a lot of uh, notes on where we are. Uh, they draw a grid of where we've searched so that we can present that when we come back to our, our mission base and they won't send somebody else out to cover something we've already covered. Completed search in that grid. Yes. Yeah. We do about 80% of the uh, ground searches in the United continental United States. 80%? Every year. Really? And it'll, it'll go as high as 90 and as low as maybe 75, but uh, 80 is, is the average. Now, do, when you do search and rescue, you participate with other agencies, I would, I'd imagine, uh, the local agencies on the ground maybe, and uh, other air units maybe for local law enforcement? Yes, uh, we fly a lot with uh, sheriff's departments and uh, some of them are well to do enough to have a helicopter. Hmm. And uh, that's really handy for us because often we will search the remote areas and the helicopters stay a little closer to home and they can uh, relay radios for us. So you don't have any rotio, ro, uh, rotary aircraft in no. the Civil Air Patrol. You're all fixed wing. We're all fixed wing. And it's mostly high wing, I would imagine? Uh, it's almost ex exclusively, well, it is exclusively high wing. Okay. And so, single so, engine. So for people in the cheap seats, uh, the high wing is the, the wing above the pilot, so you have much more visibility below. Yes. Rather than the low wing where if you look down, you have to look at a wing. Yes. And it's kind of hard to see the ground. And that's why we have the high wing. Right, right. It's so, a little difficult to see up, but it's great for seeing down. And, and you, you fly uh, fuel efficient, really durable planes. Yes, uh, we fly primarily the, the Cessna 182 uh, with a variable pitch prop engine, what they call an altitude engine. Uh, we also have 172s that we use primarily for training. Uh, and the reason we don't like to use those for searches is that it's really hard to fit a crew of, of four in there. They're tight. And so when I was flying, it was a C-150. Yes. And uh, I didn't even need help putting it out on the runway. I could just pick up the tail and push it out onto yes. the runway to prep it, and then I could fuel it. And uh, the, 70, the 172, not much bigger, and you have to have a, kind of a weight allowance, right? You put yes. too much in the back seat, you tend to tip up and you could stall. Yes. You lose too much airspeed, yeah. Uh, so we have to watch the weight and balance very carefully. All right. Uh, but it also, because uh, many of our crew have put on a few pounds over the year, and they tend to be older. <laughs> really? Uh, mm. Gaining weight when you're older? Uh, yeah. It, I, it I haven't experienced that <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know better than that. <laughs> I just know how to hide that. <laughs> you, you are your father's son. Uh, but... Um, because of that, sometimes we have to limit, limit the fuel on the 172, so we try not to fly those for search missions. Right. Because we need to loiter in the search area for up to four hours. Four hour flight time is pretty good. Four hours in the air with four guys. Yes. That's a very good aircraft. Yes. It's about all, all the crew's bladders can take. And it, that aircraft doesn't have to fly tremendously fast. I mean, it's the speed, how fast in miles per hour do you have to fly just to keep enough air over the wings to keep you in there? It's not uh, much, is it? No, it's not. It, it uh, will stall um, with the flaps down at about uh, 49 that's, that's, knots. That's not even moving. Most of us would get frustrated on the freeway if we're driving 49 <laughs> miles an hour. <laughs> well, we fly most of the search missions at, at uh, 80 and sometimes get down below that, but we need special permission to, to do that because uh, we fly, and nobody gets lost on flat ground. They all get lost in the mountains right. or the deserts or right, someplace right. like that. <laughs> and so we're, we're in the hill country all the time. I, I wanna hear more about that. We're gonna take a little break. We're gonna pay some bills. We'll be right back. Till then, everybody stay safe. Aloha, I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time 
to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Thanks for playing everybody. Thanks for coming back. This is the second part of the show, The Cyber Underground. Again, I'm Dave Stevens. I teach at the University of Hawaii, Kapi'ilani Community College. I teach, ne teach network uh, security and ethical hacking. And today we're talking with Lieutenant Colonel David Shoemaker uh, from the Civil Air Patrol. Let's get right back to it. We're talking about nobody gets lost in areas that are easy to search. They all tend to find their way into remote areas, hilly areas, tree cliffs, caves. Yes. Uh, whitewater rapids, volcanoes. Yeah, and, tell and us some of the great stories you have. Well, uh, I, I was sent out on a search mission uh, very soon after I joined, uh, and I was flying the, the right seat as an observer and co-pilot, and um, we were told that the person we were looking for was in a pine forest, and the trees were spaced fairly widely apart, but he was dressed in brown pants and green shirt. Perfect. Which made him look like a pine tree. Like a tree, right. Yeah. Um, we didn't find this individual. Uh, we found later that uh, his vehicle had burned up with him in it. And oh. uh, so that we, we didn't score on that one. Oh, yeah. But we, uh, we have a, a pretty good success rate. And I, for the, at the moment, I can't tell you exactly what that is. I don't remember. But it's, uh, it's pretty good. It's nice to have you guys in the air. And let's talk about uh, how you get funded. Okay. So, Can I cover one other thing? On sure, that? go right ahead. Um, one of the capabilities that we developed ourselves was a send cell phone forensic uh, capability. And we have uh, teams uh, who collaborate. Uh, people in Arizona collaborate with people on the East Coast via conference calls and things like that. Look over each other, the other's shoulders as they analyze the data. Um, and our cell phone forensic team uh, is being called on more and more by law enforcement to find people who are lost. And this is to triangulate a location? Yes. Yes, yes. Based on pings on towers. So let, let's, again, for the people in the cheap seats, let's fill them in. Okay. So cellular technology is a group of cellular towers or radio towers that can communicate with a cell phone at any given time. And as you move with your cell phone, you communicate with different towers because you become uh, out of range of some and in range of others. And at any given time, you can have up to three towers that uh, can all ping your phone or contact your phone at any given time. And that's, you can triangulate uh, a very specific area if you have close towers uh, of someone holding that cell phone. And just to give people in, the, in this state uh, an idea, if you're in the city of Honolulu, downtown or in the Ala Moana Center, we can get uh, within about six feet of a cell phone to triangulate. However, if you're hiking Diamond Head, it's half a mile. So there can be a, a great deal of variance. So I was just curious, when you guys are homing in on a cell phone, what is your, your area gap? How, how close can you, you get that? And as you just pointed out, it depends a lot on the terrain. Mm. Um, and <clears throat> I'm not an expert on that technology. Uh, we use it. Uh, it gives us a clue where people are. Uh, one of the things that we like people to do when they go hiking is take a personal locator beacon that uh, broadcasts on the 406 band. And the reason for that is that we have equipment in the plane which will track that. So it's basically a transponder. You rent these at the, the local shops when you go hiking? Yes. You rent camping gear and so forth? Yeah. Often you can rent them for five bucks a day. And they, you can buy them for a couple hundred dollars. So I would think that's a significant value. I mean, if you're searching for a camper, at the very least, if you get that beacon, even if you can't home in locally and, and get a good fix on that person, you can eliminate a wide swath of territory that you don't need to search, yes? Yes. 
And uh, when we talk to people who have been located uh, because they had these beacons, they all tell us the same thing. I am so glad <laughs> that I did this. I would imagine the, the, the 406 band, I would imagine, is an easier carrier wave than, say, uh, most local cell phones, which use a higher frequency band and it tends not to be able to get around hills and, and through tunnels as easy as, say, the, the, the lower bandwidths. Is that true? Uh, to some degree, yes, but it's, it's still uh, line of sight. But when, when, when we're in the air, of course, uh, we get line of sight better than somebody on the ground does. With a lot of other stuff, yeah. We do two things for sheriff's ground teams uh, very frequently. We, we help them locate the, the people, the area that they're in. Uh, sometimes we can spot them from the air. When people hear a plane overhead and it's red, white, and blue, they tend to come out of from, from that, everywhere they are. I didn't even ask that. You paint your, your, your colors are red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue. Like, okay. <clears throat> All right. And they tend to wave uh, whatever they have. If they have an international orange panel, they'll get it out. <laughs> and that helps us to see them because from 1,000 feet, uh, where we usually fly over the terrain. People are ants. It's, it's hard to, yeah. to detect. We will fly as low as 500 feet, uh, but that, again, requires uh, special permission from our headquarters to do it. Well, you're taking on a little bit of risk when you fly that low. Yes. Right. There's there's everything from thermals to really tall trees. And also, uh, in a single-engine aircraft, uh, you're always faced with the possibility of engine failure. So we use uh, a national, uh, nationwide maintenance contract, uh, and we get what I think are the best. Uh, our planes are well maintained. Now you have to you bring them in every so often every every so many hours that you fly, you yes. get a complete rebuild. We right? yes, and and we use the FAA <clears throat> the FAA standards for that, uh -huh. and uh, they're reasonably strict. Yeah. I've been flying uh, fixed wing for a number of years. I've never had an engine failure. Well, that's remarkable. I know there's a between the seats on the 150. There was a little fuel stop, and uh, <laughs> I, I went for my camera once, and the camera strap caught that. And as I pulled up my camera, I shut off my fuel supply, and that was an interesting event. And yes. that's when I realized that if you fly too low, you don't have time to turn the fuel back on, realize what you've done, and restart the engine and get some more air over your wings, pick up some lift, and, and get out of the situation. At 500 feet, you might hit the ground before you can get all that done. So it, it's nice to fly a little bit higher. Yeah. Uh, the saying in, in uh, the flying community is that uh, altitude is insurance. <laughs> the higher you are, the more I, time you have to react. I like that saying. Yeah? Okay, I could use that in other areas of my life besides flying, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the Civil Air Patrol. I know people are uh, exceptionally worried these days about how government agencies spend their money, because these are all tax dollars that go towards funding organizations that support us and rescue us and keep us safe and protect the nation. Uh, how is the Civil Air Patrol funded? Uh, two ways. One, we get about $40 million a year from the Air Force. And that goes mostly into uh, airplanes, communications, equipment, and vehicles. Um, the rest of it we do ourselves through fundraising. Oh, but one, and that's fantastic. So we're, we're busy much of the time with, with fundraising, trying to get the money to do what we do. Uh, and it, it's uh, not always easy. There are a lot of people out there fundraising with us. Really? Competitors, oh yes. Asking for money. Ask <laughs> it's a national pastime. That is, well, that's our pastime at the university, so I, 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 kinda, I can commiserate, yeah. We're always asking, uh, hey, can you fund this new building? Can you fund uh, books, you know? See, but you're you, a competitor. I No, you have a much more significant <laughs> mission than we do. And I, I gotta compliment uh, the Civil Air Patrol in the United States Air Force having served in the Marine Corps, I, I feel, and I was stationed at Lackland Air Force Base, which is where the Air Force yes. boot camp is, and it, there's Kelly Air Force Base right there, and it, I, I was impressed with the United States Air Force, I, I always have been. It, it seems like the top of the line, some of the smartest people, the most dedicated staff, and it is one of the, uh, I think, the best organized uh, uniformed armed services. And their whole program is, is to do the mission safely. Right. And I, I'm involved in that aspect of, uh, of it in the CAP. I'm a master safety rated uh, mission based safety officer, mission safety officer. So I, I enjoy that part. 
Going back to the funding, uh, one of the reasons we're such a bargain is that uh, we return uh, almost $160 million a year in labor. Oh, that is a value. Yeah. So we're we're getting we're giving back about four times what we what we take in. That's that's a good benefit. And, I mean, uh, put some money out, and you don't have to pay people to work. You're yes. paying for equipment. I would think that's an easy budget to authorize. For the most part, it is. We yeah. we generally don't have any tr problem. Uh, we're the Air Force is very supportive. The Congress has been very supportive, um, and we haggle at times for nickels and dimes, but. Uh, they have been very supportive of our efforts. With our last couple of minutes, I want to talk about you again. Now, you um, you gave up a, a leadership position, a pretty significant one in, in the CAP, so you could go back to what you really love doing, flying. And I got to tell the audience, you're 76. 78. 78. I'll be 78 in December. 78 in December. Wow. And you're still flying. That gives me uh, a lot of pride and a lot of hope. It's, it's nice to know that I'm going to be kicking, you know, when I get to be 77, 78 years old. Uh, you have rigorous FAA standards that you have to physically meet. Yes. In order to qualify to fly that plane. And every year I have to take a flight physical uh, at the commercial pilot level uh, to do that. So commercial pilot level, United Airlines. No. American Airlines, that commercial no, that's, pilot? That's a, uh, an air transport pilot, mm -hmm. ATP. Okay. And uh, that requires, uh, I think it's minimum 1,500 hours of flight time now, multi-engine rating, instrument rating. Uh, I'm instrument rated. I'm not, uh, I'm not current at the moment. Um, I'm not multi-engine rated. Couldn't afford it. So instrument rated, that means that you could fly without visibility. Yes. With just instruments. Yes. That's difficult, but you have new equipment to help you out with that. In our, in our last 30 seconds or so, what's your most, uh, your favorite equipment on the plane that helps you with your instruments? The iPad. The iPad. <laughs> They've got an application with, that, that does this. Yeah. With ForeFlight, absolutely. And yeah. there are other apps that uh, do the same thing. Garmin has one. Um, there's FlyQ and, and WingX and several others. You hear uh, that, Apple? There's an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> Even for the Civil Air Patrol, I love it. It's good that you guys are using the most current technology to accomplish the mission and keep uh, on top of the task. And I, I dislike when people fall into disrepair and they get lackadaisical and they don't have motivation. It seems like you guys are right on top of it and I feel safer having you guys around. You're based in Washougal, Washington. But you fly a lot out of Portland, too. Yes, I'm actually uh, a member of the Oregon Wing. And mm -hmm. until two weeks ago, I was chief of staff of the Oregon Wing for two years. Chief of staff. That's the position I was talking about that you, I you gave up because you wanted to fly some more. Dragged in on, on the administrative side because they needed help, and I was glad to give it. But uh, there comes a time when I need to get back to what I came for. Now you're glad to give it up. I'm like uh, the guy that was on his way to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> He's always on his way to Australia. Uh, the movie, uh, Support Your Local Sheriff. That's the one. The classic James, one, James, James Garner. Garner. Yeah, that's right. Well, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, And, and I, I hope everyone uh, has more respect for the Civil Air Patrol. And uh, I didn't even know what it was before you joined. Uh, I got an announcement to make really quick. Uh, Wet Wear Wednesday's coming up at Capilani Community College on Halloween night from 6 to 8 p.m. Free food, free soft drinks, free water. And come on by and see our beautiful campus and check out all of our IT programs, including ethical hacking and uh, data analytics, our new program. Please come out and join us uh, if you're in the local area. And thank you to our guests for being here. And aloha, everybody. Until next week, stay safe.